Hello folks, today we are going to learn about a reading strategy called Notice and Note Nonfiction Signposts. Before we begin, please make sure that you have copied the RN Nonfiction Signposts into your reader's notebook because as you're watching this video, you can edit and add information to your signpost slides. So let's begin. The first question you probably have is what are nonfiction signposts? Well, nonfiction signposts do two things for readers. First of all, they help readers understand what writers are doing and why they're doing what they're doing. Why did the author use this word? Why did the author include this information? Why did the author organize their writing this way? So we're going to understand the what they're doing and the why they're doing it. The second reason why I like nonfiction signposts is they help you, a reader, analyze the text with your own reactions instead of just using a study guide. So the nonfiction signposts help you more authentically uh, take charge of your learning and provide you with a way to voice your own reactions rather than just answering questions that are paired with a text. The first signpost is called Contrasts and Contradictions, and its abbreviation is C and C. A contrast and contradiction occurs when there's a contrast between what you know and what the author shows you. So for example, if an author surprises you with information that you weren't aware of, or if the author contradicts an idea that you've already had, then you need to stop and pause and mark down a CNC, a contrasting contradiction. Once you note the CNC in the text, you should answer the anchor question. What is the difference between what the author shows and what I already know? And why does that difference matter? Here's an example from a text that we read together about lionfish. The CNC that I found in the text was about lionfish themselves. I always thought the lionfish was beautiful, but I didn't know it was a dangerous invasive species. So the author contrasted my understanding of this beautiful lionfish with the facts that they're actually very bad for the environment. And then I answered the anchor question. It's important to learn more about invasive species, where they come from and how they hurt our environment so we can prevent future species from causing harm. When we start to work with signposts and I assign you a reading to do, I will give you a grid that looks like the one on the screen here. It will have four columns like this. The first is where you'll identify the signposts. So for the lionfish article, I had a C and C. The second column is where you would explain the CNC. I always thought the lionfish was beautiful, but I didn't know it was invasive. The third column is where you'll quote where the CNC is in the text. And I quoted, they do not belong in the Atlantic and they are upsetting the natural balance of the environment. That's where I first learned in the article that lionfish are dangerous. And then finally, you'll answer the signpost question, why it's important to acknowledge the contrast. It's important to learn more about the invasive species, where they come from and how they hurt our environment. So this is what you're going to be using more or less to record your signposts as we start to incorporate them into our classroom assignments. The second signpost is called extreme or absolute language and the abbreviation is EL for extreme language. Whenever you see the author suddenly using language that leaves no doubt or exaggerates or pushes the limit, then you've found an example of extreme language. The anchor question that you'll then ask after you find extreme language is why does the author say it like that? Hmm. The answer might tell you the author's point of view or their purpose. You might also realize that the author is exaggerating to make you think a certain way. Here's an example from a text we read together of extreme language. This is from the Living on Mars article. It's not easy to live on Mars. There's not enough oxygen to breathe. It's a frigid negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit. And the atmosphere is so thin that if you step outside without special gear, your blood will fizz up like soda and you'll die within seconds. 
The imagery used to describe the dangers of Mars is extreme, like this phrase, your blood will fizz up like soda and you'll die within seconds. To me, when I read that right away, I thought that is wild. That is an extreme language example. And why did the author say it like that? I think the author uses this language to shock the reader and hook us into continuing to read. It also highlights how dangerous space missions are and why astronauts take so much time to be prepared. Just to show you again how this might look if you were doing a classroom assignment, you would continue noting your signposts. The CNC was from the Lionfish article. This example of extreme language was from the Mars article. You would say in your own words what the signpost is. The imagery used to describe the dangers of Mars is extreme and it's frightening. You would prove the signpost is there by giving me a quote from the text. Your flood will fizz up like soda and you'll die within seconds. That's very extreme. And then you answer the signpost question. Why does the author use the extreme language? And I've already read that for you on the previous slide. So again, this is how we will start annotating and taking notes and responding to text as we begin to incorporate our signposts into our nonfiction reading assignments. Our third signpost is called Numbers and Statistics. The abbreviation is NS. And you would note a number and statistic when you're reading and you notice numbers or number words or amounts. So if you see a number in the text or an amount of something, you could mark an NS, the number and statistic. The anchor question that you'll then answer is why did the author use those numbers or amounts? And the answer, might help you come to a conclusion, make a comparison, see the details, find facts, or recognize evidence. So NS, or numbers and statistics, can really help you collect some data and facts and also identify evidence. Here's an example from an article we recently read of number and statistics. This is the infographic from the article about food waste. Lots of numbers here and even more numbers in the caption. In this infographic, Kristen Lewis reveals the outrageous amounts of food wasted in the United States every year. So I've abbreviated my signpost and I've explained where I found it. And then I answered the signpost question. Why did the author mention the, these numbers? Lewis specifically mentions the amount of produce, seafood, cereal, and dairy we waste to reveal that food waste happens across all categories and types of food and the amounts are far more than what we might have expected. Our fourth signpost is quoted words and the abbreviation is QW. And a quoted word signpost happens when the author quotes a voice of authority, a personal perspective or other words, like maybe from a document like the constitution or the declaration of independence. Your anchor question when you find quoted words is why did the author quote or cite this other person? The answer can reveal an author's bias, their purpose, conclusions, or their point of view. And these words will give facts, opinions, perspectives, or generalizations. Quoted words are easy to find because they are in quotations. Here's an example from a text we read together about Animal Crossing. In it, Dr. Rachel Cowart, a psychologist who studies gaming, explains, games are great at fixing our mood and reducing our stress and anxiety. So this quoted word, I put QW to cite what signpost I identified, and then I explained where I found it, that Dr. Rachel Cowart was quoted here in the Animal Crossing article. And then my signpost question is, why did the author quote or cite this other person? Cohort is cited because her knowledge helps explain the connection between Animal Crossing's popularity and the psychology of gaming. She reveals that in times of stress, like the COVID-19 pandemic, games can help people cope. So that's why she was used by our author in this article. Our last signpost is called Word Gaps, and WG is your abbreviation. And you'll note a word gap when the author uses a word or phrase that you don't know. And then once you identify a word gap, the question you should answer is, do I know this word from someplace else? Does this seem like technical talk for experts? Can I find clues in the sentence to help me? 
Here's an example of a word gap, and this is from our lionfish article. Uh, ecological and invasive species, I noted as word gaps. I said I wasn't sure what ecological or invasive species meant when reading. And then my question says, do I know this word from somewhere else? Is it technical talk? Can I find clues? So I said, I know the word ecology is in ecological, so it has to do with nature and the environment. And invasive species reminds me of the word invasion, which means that something or someone is going to a place where they are not wanted. So I helped try to define these words based on what I already knew about them and based on information I found around them. So word gaps will be cited when you see words you don't know. So again, these are our five signposts, and I think they are very useful because they help you personalize your learning. Everyone's signposts will look different after we read a nonfiction article. Sometimes we'll find commonalities between one another's observations, and sometimes our observations will be different. And I think that's what makes the signposts so interesting and also really helpful, especially when you're doing an analysis. So I hope that these notes helped you complete your set of nonfiction signpost notes in your writer's notebook. And we're gonna start working on applying our signposts in this format as we continue reading nonfiction articles. Thank you and email me with any questions you have.